you had a question? I think we have time for one more question. Okay, uh, with regards to the 48 units, uh, you mentioned that the government had a contract, but then made the decision not to enforce it. Uh, do you have any insight why that was the case and how they went ahead to get a, another contract in Alberta? Also, um, I ask this because it reflects on how seriously the government takes the issue of homelessness. Uh, 48 units would have gone a long way, I think. And, and the title said that, you know, we have a democratic right to ask for more. Um, why did people not demand for more in this case? So I'll just repeat that for people that couldn't hear that. So she's asking about the 48 uh, units that were kind of given away, invested, I guess, and how we as people can democratically demand more. It's the gist of the question. Uh, just a quick quip that um, there's no rational reason why the government didn't enforce their contract with Devro Developments. Um, the minister did was quoted in the paper as saying, it's not like we have homeless people in our community anyway. Uh, and that's uh, our social services minister, uh, Donna Hardpower. Oh man, I sometimes don't know how to follow you. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know what, what the reasons were. I mean, you, the, the reasons that were given, um, just to refresh, so we talked about it, there's a 48 unit building. Essentially what happened was there was an option for either crawl spaces or basements under uh, the contract that Devereaux had signed with the government. The government chose for there to be basements. Neither the government or Devereaux did a proper site evaluation when they drilled down for basements as opposed to crawl spaces, they actually hit the aquifer and it flooded the site. And that's where the $400,000 cost overrun came from. Um, their reasoning was to invest that extra $400,000 would set a bad precedent uh, that people could just undervalue their contracts when they sign them and then have cost overruns and the government would pay for it. Um, my perspective, our perspective at Carmichael Outreach was it's a significant lost opportunity to invest in something that's far more financially and socially efficient. Like, um, I think Deborah would actually just ask them to split the cost so it wasn't even a full $400,000, it was $200,000. bucks. So I mean, if you put it in the context of what we talked about, you know, 2300 bucks a month for shelter, um, and you had 96 people or whatever the number is over two months that use up that money as opposed to 48 people that are going to be in housing and costs a lot less to the taxpayer. Um, why don't we demand better? Uh, if I was to be the ultimate pessimist that I feel like I'm becoming, uh, politics is all about competition for control of the narrative. So, not coincidentally, when we called out the government on that decision, the very next day, there was an unveiling event for a project that had already been unveiled. And quite faithfully, the media showed up, asked a bunch of questions, took a tour, and promoted how great the work the government was doing in affordable housing. So, we have to, I sound like a conspiracy theorist right now, and I'm really not, but we have to recognize politically, at least in my opinion, that the vast majority of what comes out uh, through media or other types of public engagement is, is a controlled narrative that's designed to do one thing, and it's to make whoever is speaking that thing look good so that they get votes on election day. And we have to sift through those things so that we actually have accurate knowledge of the scenarios that we're coming across. And um, part of that means that we all have a responsibility to engagement, and part of that means that then, out of that responsibility to engagement, we then get the privilege of democratically demanding better from those that we elect to represent us. One more part that you uh, may not be aware of, but Devro, <laughs> do, do you know, actually I should have asked, do you know who won the Developer of the Year for 2014? Devro! <laughs> so, do we at least Okay, so we have one last question. I see your hand up there. Um, just real quick. When we talk about uh, homelessness in a very fast growing city like we have, obviously gentrification becomes an increasing issue as, as, as the city grows and grows and property values obviously increase. Obviously, displacing people in lower income communities. And um, basically, my question is when you guys have your dialogue with the city and do planning, do they have um, 
any kind of plans in place for basically the future of homeless population that's just going to come as a result of the city growing as fast as it is, as it is right now. Okay, did everyone catch that? Talking about gentrification, how it maybe displaces uh, lower income communities and what's the city's plan? Is that kind of fair? Okay, a couple of thoughts on this. One is that we often see gentrification, the start of gentrification, when a neighborhood is in a rough spot, has low property values, and a bunch of uh, artists and bohemians move in and, and drop up those, those property values. I would argue that gentrification actually starts decades before that, when we start letting the neighborhood get low property values in the first place. That's like, the root of gentrification is letting the neighborhood slide, you know? Um, so ultimately, I think this city's goal and every city's goal should be to have neighborhoods that are, that are stable, right? That means having a mix of housing. Um, we hear a lot of about North Central, or I live in Heritage, so we, I'll pick on Heritage. Um, Heritage community in the city. Um, you know, we have to keep in mind with these downtown neighborhoods that are now faced with some issues uh, were created. They, they were like the Harbor Landing of Regina. You know, they were like nice new houses, all, all cookie cutter houses that look the same and were marketed to young families to pay a premium to live in a new neighborhood. When we, when we create a neighborhood that's all the same housing type, what happens is we have all the same demographics move in. We have all the, dem the same demographics raise their children, their children move out, they get old, they move out, and you get this cycle of like people coming and going, which in my mind is bad for small business, it's bad for school populations, and it's bad for the neighborhood in a whole because you get property values going up, property values going down, and property values going up. So ideally, neighborhood design-wise, we need to create neighborhoods that are, are mixed neighborhoods. They have all different types of housing types. Um, I, I think we're on to that. I really, I'm always impressed with Regina's planning department and our, our new official community plan, I think, really gets that. You know, I think that new neighborhoods are, are forced to be more, more mixed and tight. Um, yeah, so I think there is some, some place around that, some you know, piece around that. Also, I have to remember that um, the downside of gentrification is people having to move. The upside of gentrification can be that neighborhoods can become uh, healthier places to free investment and get more small business, more stable school populations, these sort of things. But unless we deal with poverty, we're just chasing you know, poverty from place to place. There's been a lot of new investment in places like Heritage, in places like North Central, but unless we're dealing with those root causes of poverty in community, well, great, you know, North Central will be a healthy community, but are we just chasing poverty to the next thing? Uh, the other part, I think, to your question is expecting the market to find its own solutions to things that it's... In. The market's been another failure in this regard. Expecting the market, the free hand of the market doesn't give a wit about homelessness or humanity or any of these things. So uh, there are some things like affordable housing that require uh, governments to uh, act in terms of providing solutions and the market will not provide these solutions and they haven't and that's plainly evident in the fact that the Vacancy rate is at a healthy 3% and yet rental costs continue to rise. That's the market. The market's going to catch up in 10 years. It'll provide, uh, next time we experience a bust, then the market may uh, finally take its hand out of its pocket or in, in, of its wallet and decide to do something. But again, I, I don't, the free hand of the market doesn't, doesn't do that. It's busy doing other things. Okay, um, so I think with that, we'll wrap it up. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming, especially our panels. So we can give them a hand. Yeah, so thanks everyone for coming. Um, we'll see you at other events maybe in the future. <laughs>